Hey everyone, it's June 27, 2013. I'm Renee Ritchie, and tonight we're talking about OS X Mavericks and the new Macs and what they might mean for next generation iOS devices. We're also talking about our podcasting workflows and Instagram going video. This is the iMore Show. We have the managing editor of iMore, Peter Cohen. How are you, Peter? Great, Renee. How are you? I'm doing, actually, it's hot and sweltering in Montreal, and I don't know how to handle it. The penguins are melting, the polar bears are begging for ice cubes on the streets, and everything is topsy-turvy. Yeah, it's a little bit like that here in Massachusetts, right, Dan? Absolutely, and I have the fan off uh, out of respect for you and our listeners, so uh, I'm, I'm extra, extra sizzling. Although, uh, it, it is a lucky day to, for us to be recording because uh, it's a l- little bit of a break from the past several days. It's, uh, it's a little bit cooler. And that is the voice of Daniel Jalkut, who you might know from Red Sweater Software. He makes Mars Edit. He also does the podcast Bit Splitting, and he does Core Intuition with Manton Reese. How are you, Daniel? I'm great. It's great to be here with you guys. It's great to be. It's always odd when I'm I listen to someone's show for a long time and then I'm actually doing a show for them because it kind of bends reality a little bit. <laughs> the intersection of uh, of media media moguls here. Uh, yeah, and, and we're going to get into that. I wanted to first get you. Um, we recently saw each other at WWDC, and that it seems like a long time ago, but it was only a couple of weeks ago. And you're a Mac developer. Apple gave a lot of love to the Mac this time. Absolutely. Yeah, that that whole uh, everybody who was primarily a Mac developer in the audience was uh, at the keynote or or, or listening online as I was, um, I think was particularly um, mollified, intrigued, stoked uh, by the uh, allusion to 10 more years of Mac OS 10 releases. And really, why wouldn't they have 10 more years? It's still the best general purpose computing operating system on the planet um but along with everybody else in the press and in the you know apple sphere those of us who are still kind of focused on the mac have not been immune to this kind of feeling that ios is taking away the show and i love ios and i intend to do quite a bit of development for ios but um as you can imagine having as much as i do have invested in the mac and still just, you know, darn it, liking the Mac, it's really reassuring to hear that we've probably probably got, you know, if they say there's 10 more years, we've probably got at least five more years. But I mean, so. there was a WWDC where there almost was no Mac at all. I mean, it was a complete iOS, and that kind of sent shivers, and people started prognosticating that iOS would just obliterate or obsolete OS X. So this was, I think, a really welcome change. Yeah, you know, the, what, what you just said reminded me of something. Uh, I was talking to Manton. You, you, know, you mentioned Manton, my co-host from Core Intuition, and kind of pontificating on the relative attention that Apple gives to the Mac or to iOS, et cetera. And the, the way I looked at it was you can't look at any given year being um, necessarily representative of – it doesn't encompass everything Apple cares about. It always encompasses the top priorities for that year for Apple. So like that year, um, I don't know which exactly you're alluding to. There are probably a couple years that would, would meet that, cri- that, you know, that, that criteria of um, being so iOS heavy that Mac kind of felt squeezed out. But that was because that was Apple's biggest priority at the time, you know, um, and concede that Apple's biggest priority continues to be iOS, but it's been nice that they have a little bit, um, they've, they've found the time and the, um, you know, the talent to put into Mac stuff over the past few years. And it's really just been getting better and better for the Mac, I think, the past few years. As most people um, who have a historical perspective on it will n- know and will will say, if you ask them, it's it, you know, the Mac has never been a more successful platform than it is today uh, in sheer numbers and sheer like, um, uh, you know, I guess you could argue back in the in the mid 80s, it was, you know, maybe more of a um, cultural phenomenon. But these days, the sheer numbers of people who have a Mac and can be a participant in the, you know, in, in the not just the community, but the the market 
is really exciting for folks like me who make their living off the off the thing. And you know, uh, Peter too, because I mean, Peter's a longtime Mac journalist, and I saw him. And we haven't podcasted since WWDC, but I saw him. Uh, almost skipping gleefully down the streets <laughs> in front of Moscone after the announcements. Is that a fair uh, characterization, Peter? Well, that was because of the molly that I dropped. <laughs> that was that. That's that's Peter's natural state. That was before he got to the keynote. <laughs> uh, that, yeah, that was right after I announced that I was quitting uh, Angry Mac Bastards. <laughs> um, no, seriously. Uh, yeah, no. Mavericks was a big deal for me. I mean, because. Leading it, leading up to it, in the weeks leading up to it, um, uh, it it had been rumored that um, uh, that 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 Apple was going to revise um, OS X with uh, features for power users. And I mean, I've been using the Mac since 1985, so if I'm not a power user, I don't know who is. And uh, I'm always happy to see those tweaks. And, uh, you know, I think that with Mountain Lion especially, a lot of people were really concerned about the direction that Apple was taking. I remember at the time there was a lot of editorializing and a lot of punditry about, um, you know, the iOSification of, of OS X. And I'm, I'm happy to see Apple sort of plant its feet in the ground and say, no, wait a minute. Um, OS X is still a very important asset to us. It's something that we're very serious about. Uh, making sure is robust and well designed for uh, for its users, and something that will attract new people to the platform um, going forward. So uh, many many of the changes that uh, that are that are in Mavericks are things that I'm excited about. Of course, I think the reason you saw me skipping down the street was because of the Mac Pro. <laughs> yeah, you all. If you had not been married already, you said that you would be lining up or stealing it and taking it to Vegas. Yeah. Well, no, I, don't, I didn't say that. But I think what I did say is that it's the sexiest trash can I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> and he's seen a lot of sexy trash cans, let me tell you. Oh, let me tell you. Yeah. That's, it, it, Daniel, as a developer who does Mac software, I mean, they this was, I think, the best Mac or, or the best OS X keynote we've had in a long time. Federici hit his stride. He was funny. Uh, he was presentable. He didn't seem nervous at all anymore. And he showed off, you know, multi-monitor support and uh, actionable notifications, which even iOS didn't get. It, in some ways, the Mac, it also got uh, a very sanitized user interface again. He made jokes about not killing virtual cows and running out of green felt. And mm -hmm. it, it was a return to the roots almost. Yeah, I mean, it was, it, you know, the, what's funny, Rene, is I, uh, I Thinking back, I'm preparing to do this show with you guys. I was thinking, what, what actually is new in Mavericks? And I think, if you're not like there reading the list of things, it's easy for some of this stuff to slip out of your mind, um, it, because it's it's a lot of little. It's kind of like a lot of quote unquote little things. Um, normally, you know, if there hadn't been sort of such a, um, a uh, at least among the like tech neurati if there hadn't been like such a, a you know rejection of some of the skeuomorphic interfaces then it certainly wouldn't be big news to um say hey we're we're making our calendar gray on gray you know that's not it's not like a big uh major os release plank but um it's a good sign that they're listening to well you know actually i mean it's just a good sign that of the fifty percent of the people in the world who who love skeuomorphic, overly skeuomorphic, in my opinion, interfaces and the thing a little more subtle, it's it's really just a sign that the um, that the people in charge at Apple are now the people who prefer something subtle. But they have um, for those of us who are excited by that change, it, it sort of does add some some sense that like there is. Um, you know, somebody somebody is awake at the at the wheel and steering this this uh, the ship in the right direction. At, at least for those of us who think that's the right choice. The two big stories for me, and I'm interested in both your takes on this, was Apple's focus on GPUs. I mean, all the OpenCL stuff or the OpenGL stuff. The fact that the Mac Pro has those giant honking GPUs welded into its Darth Vader helmet, and the focus on power management and battery life. And they announced a lot of things that aren't sexy user interface features or APIs for developers, but will let me sit at the coffee shop using Mars Edit on my MacBook Air for 12 hours now. Right. So in other words, you're going to be able to sit in the coffee shop 
on your MacBook Air for six hours, <laughs> but it is nice when the estimate gets <laughs> higher, then the actual also usually gets higher. Um, I am actually, since you mentioned it, I'm excited, and I and I haven't had a chance. I you know obviously I'm a registered developer. I have access to the early releases of the OS. Um, and I haven't had a chance to look at some of the stuff they allu alluded to in the keynote as far as um, the power management stuff goes. But I like that it, you know, from a developer point of view, it gets me kind of excited when I when I hear about a systematic approach to trying to improve the efficiency, not just of the, the device itself, but of the software that's running on the device. And the message I got from the keynote was we as developers will um, not only be sort of like led toward, you know, techniques that help, you know, chip in on that battery life thing, but also that um, a lot of developers are going to be more easily scrutinized for that. I mean, the impression I got from the keynote was it will be relatively easy. Did you guys pick up on this? Yeah. It will be relatively easy for users to sort of attribute power usage to specific apps. I think he showed so, a drop down. You went to the menu and he showed a drop down that listed the application and how much power it was using. And that might just have been to shame Chrome. I'm not positive. Right. Well, I'm sure that <laughs> it, any demonstration has a has a political aspect to it, I'm sure. But um, the, the nice thing to me is I like to be shamed if it leads me to make better software. So love for other developers to be shamed as a user if it leads them to take their problems seriously. So, um, you know, tools in the past um, that have helped shine the light on uh, memory usage, for example, uh, a lot of even just like everyday average users will send in a bug report if they see something in Activity Monitor that looks like an overly hungry app using up memory. And it kind of sounds like with Mavericks, we'll have a uh, similar metric. Every armchair developer in the world is about to hit your email box, Dan. <laughs> That's right. You know what? I'm, I have text expanded. <laughs> I can respond to that. I'm equipped. But I uh, do that. And honestly, I actually have some text expanders that are curse words that, re that actually expand into very nice, thank you for your feedback. So I get the catharsis and I get the good customer service. That's a, that's a really clever use. <laughs> and I wonder if they have uh, marketed that. To, I'll mention all. it to Gene. That'll be awesome. Yeah. Uh, I'm not a lot mountain. Sorry, not mountain, not sea lion, not mountain lion junior. Um, Mavericks is it's this weird thing, and it's hard for me to discuss because it's under NDA, which means that when you download it as a developer, you agree not to talk about anything that Apple didn't show on the keynote or show on Apple.com. But at the same time, Apple ceded Maverick review units to uh, you know Jim Dalrymple at The Loop, who writes with Peter, and to Macworld, and to Engadget, and to The Verge, and they've done reviews of it already. So we're kind of in this Schrodinger's box of yeah. NDA. So. I'm going to be careful, but I'm going to talk about stuff that I've read from legitimate sources. So I hope that walks a, a fine enough. Is that okay? Is that an okay line, Peter? Yeah, I think so. And you know, it's it's uh, it's 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 funny, Renee, because you zeroed in on exactly for me what makes uh, Mavericks so interesting, and it, it's it's the uh, the power management and uh, memory management and CPU management that's under the hood that uh, is so exciting because if you take a look at Apple's you know entire philosophy um, around the way that its devices work, um, this really goes to the heart of it. Just to get the the, uh, the, the maximum experience out of what uh, people are doing and 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 to get the hardware out of the way as much as possible, so people are just having the user experience that they need to have. And it's very frustrating right now, I think, for a lot of mobile users to, you know, have to uh, pop their laptop in their bag and make sure that they've got their, their AC adapter. And when they get to where they're going, make sure to plug in because they don't want to run out of juice. And uh, admittedly, you know, for some of us, it's it's easier to manage this than others. But um, it's it, it it can be really difficult. So the stuff that um, Apple talked about in the keynote, and the stuff that Apple's posted on the website, things like timer coalescing and um, AppNap, you know, which makes apps that aren't running in the in the foreground and aren't doing anything important uh, uh, to fall asleep, and you know, Safari Power Saver and uh, better efficiency uh, for iTunes HD and uh, compressed memory so swap files are smaller. Um, all this stuff. Um, adds up to a better end user experience period and I think that, that that's really important going forward 
Um, during the keynote, uh, uh, Phil Schiller, I think, uh, emphasized uh, OpenCL and sort of um, tut tut tutted developers <laughs> yeah. and said, you, you guys know you should be using this. Um, and that's a real clear indication of where they're going with the Mac Pro because the Mac Pro, you know, has um, up to 12 cores and it's got this these honking fast dual GPUs in it. They can also be programmed for uh, uh, parallel computing tasks. I'm going to be really, really interested um, six or seven months down the road to see um, how things are getting optimized to really take advantage of that. Because I know, like, for example, with my Mac Pro, and my Mac Pro is a five-year-old unit, uh, there's some apps, apps that are thoroughly um, designed for um, for spreading their load to multiple cores, run so much faster on that than they do on any other Mac I own still. Like if I'm doing a handbrake video rip, oh my God, I just love watching all of the CPUs. 100% lights up like I'm a Christmas tree. <laughs> it lights up like a Christmas tree and it's a beautiful thing. You know, it's it's a fun thing to watch because you know that that, C that CPU is working as hard as it can. And, you know, it's nice to have a, a movie ripped in 12 minutes as a result. You know, Daniel, our, m our mutual friend Guy English did a post. He woke up Kicking Bear for a couple minutes and did a post on the kind of software we might see when developers all start moving over to um, general purpose computing on GPUs. Right. Um, I think that was an interesting take. He knows an awful lot more about that than I do uh, coming from his game programming background. You know, I sort of see, um, I can appreciate as a, you know, most of the stuff I work on is, I want to make it as performant as possible, but it's not the kind of stuff where I'm usually being pushed into maximizing, you know, use of every GPU. Um, that's the kind of thing that is was great about Apple, you know, using like... Um, Grand Central Dispatch to sort of allow programmers like me who aren't necessarily motivated to become experts at utilizing all of the various computing resources of the Mac to just get that for free. So um, I think he has a good point, though, that, I mean, from from what he said, it's like this thing, you know, I'm not a game player. I don't do um, scientific, um, you know, computational stuff. So it's, it's a little bit... Uh, fuzzy for me like I'm, I'm more maybe on on peter's wavelength of like how fast can this thing you know rip a cd or rip a, a dvd render your podcast and, yeah well that's an, yeah exactly and logic pro if logic pro can spit this thing out in uh hour you know not an hour <laughs> you know it takes it takes a good few minutes yeah. at least for um dumping uh you know an hour long show now if it could do that in 20 seconds sure i'd be happy and excited about that and um it does set since you mentioned it, that does sound like the kind of thing that uh, GPU stuff would be would be good at doing. I want to get more into the podcast stuff in a second, but there's two things that I just wanted to bring up, and they're sort of counterpoints. I wonder how much of the future of OS X and the Mac we saw in iOS and we'll see in the iPhone 5, and how much of new iPhone technology or iOS technology we saw on the Mac, because it's easy to think that the same kind of battery optimization um, would, I mean, it, everyone wants to know what's going to be different about the iPhone 5S, because it's, you know, theoretically going to look like the iPhone 5. But if Apple does something similar with the A7 chip, where it's uh, about as powerful as it is now, because very few people are complaining about the power of iPhones, but it gets tremendously more, even, you know, just significantly more battery life, that could be really interesting. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, if, you know, the new, maybe not the exact same look, but if the new type of uh, not really gamified, but objectified user interface starts coming to the Mac where everything is rendered on the GPU and everything is a plane that developers can move around and they get all that stuff for free as well. Um, the platforms start to be familiar again, but you know, not the same, but we get really long battery life and really next generation interface. Yeah, well, I think, um, I think the interfaces are already significantly merging. I mean, we saw it with... Um, the uh, increase ever since the iPad, there's been an increase in popover style UI on Mac apps. Um, you see things like instead of a, a drop down a menu from a toolbar, uh, you know, from a, a menu bar item, you'll see a, a popover style window display. Um, it's kind of a it's kind of like a real technical dis uh, disti distinction there, but the look and feel of it is is very different. In, in like those popover style windows, you. You know, th uh, three years ago on a Mac. Um, and then I think I was also thinking the same thing, looking at iOS 7, and as I said, being primarily a Mac developer, I'm thinking, okay, how are some of these 
interesting things going to adapt to um, to the Mac. And you know, there's a lot of new stuff uh, in iOS seven specifically with how things get laid out and you know how user interfaces appear and i'm not sure how many of those are public but um th uh, they hint at things that would make perfect sense on the mac and i think it will be a situation where any of that stuff eventually if you know apple continues to be motivated about developing uh, for the mac the thing that I, I think is becoming increasingly clear won't happen is some kind of, you know, really low level unification. Mm -hmm. Like there's speculation from really from day one of the iP of the iOS SDK that UI kit was sort of the next generation uh, of app kit uh, on the Mac. And yeah. I think we'll see some some areas where they kind of borrow features from each other. But you know, there's this mm, this bottom line this bottom line distinction which is you don't directly manipulate the screen on the Mac and I think that's going to continue to be an, not just a, you know you can look at it as an as an iPad user and say that's a, a drawback of the Mac but look how many people are plugging in external keyboards into an iOS uh, mm -hmm. device and there's just there are these obvious advantages to either one and I think AppKit today maximizes support for all of those non-direct inter interactions and obviously iOS is great for anything that involves taps, touches, you know, spreading uh, the screen, pinching, et cetera. You know, also because Paul Haddad just hates AppKit unreasonably. So I'm just happy it exists only so that we don't have to stop him <laughs> complaining. Um, Peter, were you surprised? That, you know, a lot of people have, you know, said that Windows is, is racing ahead because they're getting that direct manipulation and physical touch that young people are used to now from the iPads, where Apple is sticking to a less direct form of manipulation by using gestures on a mouse pad. Uh, were you surprised they stuck to that? I wasn't. No, not at all. You know, I, I it's for, for, for me, um, uh, you know, trying to graft uh, one interface onto one operating system versus the other is sort of like trying to put an outboard motor on my car. <laughs> you know, it just doesn't really make any it, it doesn't make any more sense um, to try to uh, rework the OS 10 interface as a touch interface than it would to buy a keyboard for my iPad. Now, I know that there are plenty of keyboards out there for the iPad, and I understand the use case for them, believe me. But it's fundamentally antithetical to the user experience of the device to graft a keyboard onto your iPad um, any way you slice it. And if you've got a special use case, then great. But 99 times out of 100, you really don't need it. And um, I, I feel the same way about a, a touch interface for a desktop operating system. You know, there are some specialized um, use cases where it comes in handy, like if you're doing a point of sale system, for example, or if you're doing a kiosk of some type, uh, where having a touch interface for um, NOS really makes a lot of sense. But for general use, I don't see any benefit to it at all. Um, although, ironically, you know, there are some occasions where I will touch the screen on my MacBook Pro and expect something to happen. You know, so every so often I'll sort of lose perspective on what operating system I'm using or 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 what the user experience is, and I'll I'll slip into uh, that alternate universe where I'm using iOS. But um, you, you know, the, the the concern that I've had with Windows 8 is that um, I feel like Microsoft has gone too far in that other direction, where um, they're they've been so focused on unifying. Um, the user experience between all of their products that um, they never stop to ask themselves, why are we doing this and is this a good idea? Mm. They had their, I'll just do a couple cheap plugs, they had their Windows 8.1 event and our sister site, Windows Phone Central, was there and they have complete coverage of all the return of the smart, sorry, return of the start button stuff that you want. And we didn't dive too deeply into iOS's design language today because we did a two-part episode on Iterate uh, this week and we got together Mark Edwards, Lorne Brichter, Louis Mancia, Dave Wiskus, Brad Ellis, Nevin Mergen, I'm going to forget somebody and feel real terrible later, uh, Clarko and... Um, I think I got everybody. I hope I got everybody. And you can find that at imore.com slash iterate. So if you really want a deep dive into iOS 7 from a bunch of the best designers on the planet, quite frankly, uh, you can go and, and listen to that. Um, Daniel, while we have you here, 
I wanted to ask you about Mars Edit because I knew Mars Edit before I knew you actually. And uh, I'm more used to run on WordPress up until last year. And every single one of us were a hardcore Mars Edit user because invariably at some point, uh, <laughs> WordPress would fail um, and we would lose tons of work. And it happened once or twice. And then we bought uh, Mars Edit. Um, is that actually the genesis of the product? Was it to save us from ourselves? I'm sorry, you cut out right in the middle of that last, very last oh, sorry. thing you said. I was saying, I, I, I know that you, you acquired uh, Mars Edit from Brent Simmons, but is that, is that maybe its true purpose is to save us um, from that level of frustration and basically save us from ourselves? Yeah, but you know, you can't blame yourself in that case. That is um, a fundamental design flaw in the, the combination of technologies, the web browser, the, um, the web software, and that case interface and they're, they're they're all working with constraints that obviously you have to grant them a little leeway in in their failure for but you know the web historically was not designed to build a feature rich application that does user friendly things like making sure all of your data is safely saved to a local disk where you have ultimate control over you know over it um, so it's kind of a miracle when any web based solution pulls off acting like even as reliable as a 10 year old windows or mac application so um i think it's more about having software that fits the you know having using using software on a platform that is more suited for the type of work you're going to do um you know there's there's also stuff like video editing software for the web mm -hmm. um you don't you don't have to think too hard about it to realize that that had better come with some extremely great advantages yeah. in order to offset the the um, benefits you you lose by leaving the desktop, and I think it's one of those um, situations that's kind of interesting. There are some really great advantages for having a web editing, uh, you know, a blog editing application, so to speak, on the web, uh, namely that it can live where the data lives, and that's something that all of these web interfaces have as an advantage over Mars edit. But um, then in exchange for that, you give up all this stuff, you know, like you were saying, like you were alluding to, you said, um, you know, you were always encouraged to use it because you didn't want to, you know, you got sick of losing data in the browser. And, and that's actually something that browsers and the apps that run on them have gotten better at over the years. It's far less likely to happen these days because of you know, a variety of things, offline storage, some of these apps take advantage of um, just smarter browsers that kind of have figured out that if you navigate away from a page, you might want all of the data that was typed into that page to still be there when you go back. Um, but they're all just fighting and fighting to get up to that standard level of normalcy. I mean, on a, on a Mac app, if if you ever had the experience once that like, you know, you typed stuff into do a, a text field and then you like clicked the about box and all of your text went away, yep. which is kind of comparable to what you're describing. Um, you would just freak out and throw that stuff out the window as fast as you could. Uh, and you know, it, people are a lot more um, forgiving of web web software, but um, you know, that's what desktop desktop and you know, native iOS, native Android, native windows stuff. Uh, we all have this in common that we have facilities for, keeping user data safe and having it persisted immediately on the device the user is using. And, um, you know, we can make automatic backups, all this other stuff. Mac OS 10 in particular is getting better and better about making um, things like auto save, you know, starting in 10.7. I've been looking at this admittedly a little late for, um, for Mars Edit in, in particular, because I have my own auto save system in Mars Edit, which, you know, if you've ever been, unlucky enough to have say flash or something crash <laughs> mars edit then um you'll been relieved to notice when you relaunch that yeah very likely you have all of your your data there uh that stuff is, is was all hand you know all homegrown um historically on the mac and apple started chipping away at it and in 10.7 they have a system where any developers who want to take advantage of it get this really great, efficient, automatic saving and restore functionality that um, 
you know, in another in another five years, just about probably just about every Mac app that you support for this or something like it. And I just don't think the you know there's gonna. I wrote about this uh, several years ago. There's uh, I wrote this blog article on the Red Sweater blog. You, it was called "You Can't Catch Me," I think, <laughs> or "Can't Catch Me," and it's about my theory that however fast the web evolves and grows and becomes more usable and more approximates a native environment the the native the native platforms and the mac in particular and ios in particular because apple is just cranking on them they just get so far ahead and it's like you know what what's what's going to be next they're going to be web what you know when are we going to have say parallax support for web apps i might be i might be talking out of my behind here uh, because for all i know it's it's there from the start but stuff like this um it's hard for a standards-based system like web Mm -hmm. programming that has to work across multiple browsers to first of all identify the things about desktop software's evolution that make that are appealing and then agree to how that will be implemented on the web um and and that particular example you had with switching to mars edit uh, because you didn't want to lose your text when you navigate away from a page, that's just like one of many examples. Or it just crashed. The, the browser just crashes so often. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. That's the other thing. And the the browser crashing, um, unless the browser then provides a sort of standard autosave type functionality, like what it does uh, provides for apps, then yeah, you you know, in, in that way, the browsers really have to try to become full-fledged operating systems and folks like you know people at google who do chrome os obviously think that's the way of the future but um personally i think um being in a position like apple where you can really focus on innovating for the platform for the devices you have at your disposal and only for those devices i mean even apple doesn't try to maintain compatibility parity uh, of functionality between iOS and the Mac. Um, they distinguish the functionality and what you can do based on the, the the strengths and weaknesses of the platform. And the web is the exact opposite of that. They try to establish a baseline functionality that virtually every computer of a certain vintage can perform. You know, it's, I mean, when you make Mars Edit, you have control over your application. There are certain system things that you won't have control over, but you have, you're have you basically master of your domain, where if I have WordPress or now I have Drupal running in a window, it is at the mercy of anything. I know they, they, I mean, they try to separate threads up, but it's at the mercy of anything else that may run in that browser, regardless of how poorly coded, poorly conceived, and poorly executed um, it is. So for me, I mean, some people have an 80-20 rule where they're happy with using the web 80% of the time and then using native apps 20% of the time when they really want to do something powerful. And I'm the opposite. I want to use a native app 80% of the time because it provides the absolute best performing, best experience possible for doing that task. And I'll use the web 20% of the time. Like, for example, if I, if I have a typo on an article and I'm at an Apple store and I can quickly bring up the web page and correct it in there and save it again. And it's just such a trivial amount of work that it's almost bulletproof. But for anything longer than a few paragraphs, I want that not only the safety of the native app, but the performance uh, and the quality of it. And I know Alan Pike had an interesting article, very similar to yours, where he was saying iOS 7 is Apple's next attempt at doing that. Because when you look at their objectified, gamified interface, um, maybe Lauren Brichter could rewrite UIKit in WebGL and do something like that. (laughs) But the odds of commodity Android hardware or Chrome OS running anything approaching that level of performance, 60 frames per second, multiple layers, blur effects, um, everything like that, it's it's really minor. I mean, they have another huge leap forward there. Yeah, and every time somebody decides to take one of those leaps forward with the Mac or any other native system, there's nobody to consult. Apple doesn't need to consult anybody. Um, about whether this is whether we're all in agreement about how things are done, um, and that that power you have as um, as an innovator when you can just say, you know what, we decided the best thing to do here is to, you know, invent a new type of plug, to invent a, a you know a new a new type of, of uh, software um, idiom, and not have to check with Firefox and IE and 
you know, WebKit and all these different entities. Um, it's just, it's, it's a really, the web is just a really fantastic, um, you know, baseline platform. I love the web, yeah, me too. but it is, um, it is just the not, not the right tool for, it's not the right tool for apps that will really make you go, Oh my God, I didn't realize computers could. It's, it's whenever you say, Oh my God, about a web app, it's, because you didn't think web apps could do yeah. that. And it's or never it's, about oh, or it's oh my god this is so awful. <laughs> <laughs> right, maybe more common. But yeah, every time you you're impressed by the, the the ingenuity and the performance and the feature set of a web app, it's like, "Oh my god, this thing does everything my 10-year-old Mac does." If that, you know, that's that's like you you are you're losing it with like admiration if they can do something like you were Yeah, it's a bit of damning with faint praise, I think. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I mean, I love the web. You said you love the web. I do too. It enables so many wonderful things. Google Docs, I'm not a huge fan of Google Docs, but it's collaboration. Like if I have to write an article with five other people or I have to share a sheet with, you know, a dozen other people, there's just nothing, there's no native app that can do that yet. So it's got its areas yeah. of excellence. And for things like Dig and things like Google Search, there are areas where it's absolutely fantastic. But when when Chrome OS came out, I tried using an iPad just in Safari for a day. And I tried using um, my MacBook Air only using Safari or Chrome for a day. And within 10 minutes, I needed a native app. It just having that, like having the Pixel, that much hardware available to me and not even be able to run Photoshop on it uh, makes absolutely no sense. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I wanted to switch gears, Daniel. Since we have you here and you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of your shows. I listen to Bit Splitting. I listen to Core Intuition all the time. I was curious, what, what sort of workflow and what sort of apps have you begun using or do you still use to put everything together? Well, I had it really, I had and have it really easy with Core Intuition because my friend and co-host Manton Reese does everything uh, with the re with the audio after I record my end. Uh, you know, I, I I use we each use Audio Hijack Pro from Rogue Amoeba. Uh, we each use a uh, Rode Podcaster mic like I'm using here, um, and we each use Skype, which you know, as we said earlier, is is a is a really really it's a really, really great, terrible app, yeah. right? It's <laughs> because it's, it's the worst thing ever, but it's better it. than everything else. Exactly. And uh, so the way we do core intuition is we each record our own end, as is common with these, uh, you know, especially with two person podcast. Uh, and then I just send him my audio and wait, you know, a day or two while he, you know, makes carves out time in his busy schedule to edit the thing. And then he pops it up on the web on our, uh, our WordPress based site and you know he does all the other stuff for that show um which is great uh and i had to when i started bit splitting i had to you know obviously it's a it's not a one person show but it's a rotating guest and i'm the one person who is common to that so i'm the person unless i hire a an editor which might be a good idea but i'm the i'm the one person in charge of that show so in that case um i still use all the same equipment but um you know, I, I added to my toolkit figuring out how to record, um, you know, a Skype guest if they if they don't have the equipment to record themselves, and uh, and then I use Logic Pro to do the um, to do the mixing and the and the uh, the final sort of um, you know dump to an audio file that then gets a little bit of further processing before uh, going up on my site. And and again, I'm using WordPress, but I I switched to um, a slightly more uh, featureful WordPress installation mm -hmm. that has a, a plugin called Seriously Simple Podcast. Give him credit, the author of this plugin. It is pretty seriously simple. Uh, it's it's pretty featureful, but it does get out of your way and kind of just do what you expect in my experience so far. It's interesting because um, I use GarageBand still, but Jason Snell was kind enough to explain to me all the benefits that derive from Logic. And it, I had this sort of nervousness about moving to Logic. I have bought it. I have downloaded it. I haven't switched over yet because I'm just so used to using GarageBand. It's so I don't even have to think about it anymore. And it reminded me of when I switched from iMovie to Final Cut Pro, that it's very intimidating at first, but now I could just never, ever imagine going back. 
Yeah, uh, I, you know, I never ended up using GarageBand, so I don't have a, a real visceral understanding of the shortcomings compared to Logic. But I read, um, I read, I think, Jason Snell's article on MacWorld about his um, assessment of some of the shortcomings. And I, as I was reading it, I was like, oh yeah, that would suck if I didn't if I didn't have access to that feature. Um, but uh, you know, one of the things that uh, I, I ended up doing Logic Pro because I kind of wanted an, an excuse to get Logic since I um, <laughs> I do some, you know, I haven't in many many years really done a lot of amateur home recording, but I like the idea of doing it, and um, it was a great excuse to get something new and modern. And I'd heard good things about Logic, and then I also had a good tip from uh, Marco Arment actually who. By the time I had started bit splitting, he was doing the um, the neutral podcast, and he was in a similar situation where you know back when he was at five by five, he didn't have to do any of the editing; he just sent his audio off. But um, now he's uh, I, I believe he's the one doing all the editing for his shows. I'd um, well, it's a guide by Jim Metzendorf. Do you guys know this yep. guy? Yep, um, him on Twitter, and he. Yeah, so um, he still has this thing for sale. He did a Kickstarter for it. It's like the something Jim Metzendorfer's Metzendorf. I, I don't know how to pronounce it, and I'm, yeah. I get my own yeah. name wrong, so I'm not going to try. Yeah. <laughs> um, but he had a great uh, yeah, it's yeah, it's Jim Metzendorf, and he had a great um, like book, and. Um, you know, in, in uh, Logic Pro, you can save settings for the various, uh, you know, virtual units like the compressor mm -hmm. and the, the gates and all that. And so he basically shipped with this ebook um, a bunch of great default settings. And for somebody like me who's super naive about all that kind of stuff, it was great to get this tip from Marco because uh, although it wasn't for sale anymore, I was able to flag and say hey can i just like send you some money and you can send me this thing and and <laughs> he was happy to do that and 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 in fact he seemed um pleased when i encouraged uh, other people on twitter to to offer the same so um folks out there if you're looking for a getting started guide and some good default settings for uh, logic pro it was a really great start for me uh he's on on twitter at metzendorf m-e-t-z-e-n-d-o-r-f and I bet he'll still sell you a copy and basically a, a, um, a setup for putting the right amount of like compression mm -hmm. and stuff like that on your audio so you don't sound like a complete noob <laughs> when, uh, when you put your audio out there. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I will put that in the show notes as well. I mean, I get weird issues. Like we did um, debug with David Gelfman, and for some reason, he and Guy ended up on the same track. I forget why. I think one of their tracks was noisy, and I couldn't use it. But he ended up on the same track as Guy. And when you listen to him in a car stereo, it sounds horrible. If you listen to it any other way, it's fine. But we've tested multiple car stereos now, and it's routinely <laughs> awful. And I have no idea um, what causes that or how to stop it happening again. And that terrifies me um, because it's, it's an uncontrolled. Yeah. It's really scary. I mean, uh, not to scare any potential podcasters off, but it is just to give you some appreciation for what goes into it. It's really hard to listen to your audio, you know, however it is you you do your work. Like I do my work here on Logic Pro with this fairly nice set of Sony headphones. And sometimes it sounds like crap on my headphones, but then when I go to my regular like iPhone headphones, it sounds great. Yeah. And sometimes vice versa. And I, I appreciate, you know, now that one of the jobs of a sound engineer is to both, you know, from experience, know how to make it. So it's likely to sound great on all of those different environments from the start. But then also, I think the really good ones, they they go to the trouble of listening to it in a variety of, of ways, like iPhone, put it on the home stereo, put it in the car stereo and put it on a put it on uh, the web and listen to it through a web browser. iPod Hi-Fi. Yeah. yeah there, <laughs> there you go. Um, and the bottom line is, you know, I think there's a relatively low expectation for quality in 
podcasting, and that's good for those of us who are not professional. Well, Leo told but... me something that made a lot of sense to me. He said, as long as one person sounds great, the audience is very forgiving. If everyone sounds like crap, they think you don't know what you're doing. But if one that... person sounds fantastic, then it just sounds like what they're used to from radio when you'd have a call-in guest that never sounded as good <laughs> as the host. Wow, that's right. a good point. I'd never thought of that before. Yeah, you mentioned that to me, Renee, when we were chatting about this a, a few months ago. Uh, and it really rings true for me. Of course, you want to make sure that if you are the host, you want to make sure that the one track that sounds great is, in fact, your yeah. track. Otherwise, it just looks like your your guest is better at um, setting up their audio than, than you Well, are. I just do a local recording. For, I, I always record the Skype thing as a backup in case anyone else's recordings fail, and I record a local version for me just so that at least one person sounds close to normal. Were you similar? Peter, I don't know how much actually, how much were you doing for the recording and processing side for Angry Mac Bastards? Very little, actually. John Welch did all of that. But what we always did was, uh, or what we continue to do, is record our... Uh, individual tracks locally and then mix them in post. Uh, that way we don't get the, um, you know, compression and weirdness problems associated with uh, trying to record uh, somebody else's Skype stream or, you know, whatever medium we might be using at that point. So uh, that's always given us the cleanest way of doing it. And in fairness, our um, audio quality was a mess for a very long time. Uh, so it took us a while to get there. But once we did, we've had a pretty solid result with the couple of exceptions of, you know, shows that just didn't work out <laughs> right for whatever reason. Uh, my my big thing is Call Recorder. I I, uh, I use Call yeah. Recorder on Skype from Ecamm, and I just, I love it. I think it's a great app. What I like about it is that it records two channels. The left channel is your audio. The right channel is everybody else's audio. So it's a lead pipe cinch to separate out the tracks um, uh, to uh, um, to do mixing in post. Yeah, I mean, we, we've done we've we do do the local recording, but it's harder when you have guests for the same reason that Daniel said. Not all everyone is set up to do it. And sometimes they record every channel by mistake or their headphones aren't great and you hear everybody in the background of their track anyway. Um, we've experimented and I think um, 5x5 does that where you record locally on the different Skype box that everyone is calling into because sometimes Skype does a lot to remove noise and things like that. And sometimes we use Soundflower in Audio Hijack to sort of capture things like uh, voicemail messages that we want to include on the show or other forms of audio. So we can get way more complicated than I have any business involving myself in. Yes. But it's a lot of fun. Sometimes sometimes I'll uh, uh, do a podcast with somebody who's a professional musician or you know, somebody who's a, a has professional audio experience. Dave Hamilton uh, yeah. from the Mac Observer Backbeat is a great example of that. And his audio setup sounds so much better than mine. I'm always like just horribly jealous. And it's because he's recording from a studio. Uh, you know, Dave is a drummer. He plays in the Mac All Star yeah. Band at the uh, uh, the uh, uh, the parties at MacWorld Expo and so on. And he just sounds great. And that's because, you know, he's got it well set up. He's uh, you know he's isolating sound. He's uh, he's got the right compression going on, and and he's doing everything in real time, so he doesn't have to fix anything later. I'm always very jealous whenever I do a podcast with him because he sounds so much better than everyone else in the Mickey room. Mickey Paplon does that too; drives me crazy. The man's the original cell phone podcaster, and he just sounds like radio. Um, Zach from Nine to Five Mac is saying Piezo is great, also, and that's also from Rogue Amoeba. I know Guy uses mm -hmm. that. I I already had Audio Hijack, so I tend to still use that. And I also cheated in a way because David Barnard from App Cubby is a uh, you know university graduate audio engineer and he was kind <laughs> enough to spend several hours with me on the phone uh tuning things that i did not even know existed so uh thank you again for that david uh not everyone has a you know a en sound engineer who's nice enough to help you out like that so i really appreciated that and and why does david not have a podcast that's the question that is the question uh, I mean, well, you, you got you got the software guy who happens to be an expert audio engineer and meanwhile, 99 out of 100 other people in this business now have a podcast. And uh, maybe he's just waiting for his moment to strike. Or maybe he's, because he's a sound engineer, he would not be satisfied with anything less than a million dollars worth of recording, up, uh, recording gear. And his entire app copy business is a front to get to that level of recording. That's it. Maybe. <laughs> there we go. 
Uh, yeah, there was a couple other quick things I wanted to ask you guys about. One was Instagram decided that they didn't need to support Windows Phone. They didn't need to support BlackBerry. What they really, really needed to do was get video going because theoretically Twitter and Vine might be taking over that territory. And I thought that entire event, I don't know if, if either of you saw it, but I thought that entire event was interesting because they basically came out and said, oh, you get 15 seconds instead of six, twice as many seconds, people. And they combined everything into one stream instead of having separate tabs for photos and video. And it just, it seems very reactionary to me, which was odd from an Instagram point of view. It does, it feels like a weak response uh, to, to have the differentiator be, I'm going to more than double the time. And, and, and it's transparent that that's not an actual innovation. That's just kind of like a, a choice. Um, it feels it feels a little bit too much like we're going to exactly copy what you do. And the only thing we can think of to improve upon that is adding time. And, you know, um, I think I was listening to Gruber and, uh, Adam Lisa Gore on, uh, on the talk show. And they were like, uh, not even convinced that 15 seconds is a superior time frame. In fact, quite the contrary. It, it, uh, one of the th one of the like redeeming qualities of Vine is that yes, it's a video. Yes, you have to stop everything you're doing to watch it, but thank God it will be done in six seconds, right? No matter how bad it is. Uh, yeah, exactly. And I, to be honest, I still can't bring myself if I see somebody posting a Vine on on Twitter. You know, usually, I'm I'm the kind of uh, kind of guy who will click a picture if if it's you know introduced in a way that intrigues me. But I, it, it'll take a lot to get me to watch even a six-second video. And these 15-second videos are like pulling teeth. It's like, you think about it, that's a, 15 seconds is like an like ad length. It's an eternity if, if you're just yeah. sitting there looking at it. And, there, you know, let's face it, these things are not usually the highest quality in the mm -hmm. world. So you're looking at somebody's amateur 15-second video. I don't know. It's, it, it's, it doesn't feel like um, an innovation that should be applauded. It feels like... It does feel like uh, an attempt to sort of counter with um, with an exact match that has some like it, it, it feels sort of disrespectful to customers because it sort of implies that customers will believe that it's better because it's, you know, three times longer. Yeah, it's it's really interesting to me because Instagram sort of claim to fame is that you could capture a moment and no matter how bad the original cameras were on smartphones or your ability to frame or compose a picture um, or, you know, even get white balance, they would fix it for you with filters and effects and turn almost anyone into... I don't want to say an artist, but someone who would have pictures that they'd be willing to share in a public medium, where Vine does have some interesting um, video stabilization technology. And, you know, that, that, that is, you know, a good idea for people using smartphones anyway. And it has filters, but neither of those things seem to combine to improve video to the extent that the original Instagram cropping and filtering mechanism improved photos. So you get a bunch of weirdly timed, executed is it is it just it's new, Peter? Am I change adverse? Are people going to get fantastic with it with time? Well, I hate to say it, but you're barking up the wrong tree asking me because I've never used Vine and I've never posted a photo to Instagram, let alone a video. And they still let you live in the United States of America has mobile. Wow. Not only that, but uh, you gave me a job. Yeah. Wow. Well, to be fair though, you were never hired as a photo editor. That's true. <laughs> As as evidenced by all of my heroes. <laughs> well, yeah, but I, I I think you could be. I think you might be qualified for uh, being a photo editor at the Chicago Sun Times. Oh, that was so bad. Oh, oh god. No, yeah, I saw Gruber link to that today. The picture of the uh, what was it the Stanley Cup uh, yeah. from the Times versus the Tribune. Oh, so well, sad. that's what happens when you don't invest in your professionals. So we're laying off all the developers. Anyone who wants to use Logo can come make the next generation of apps. You're right. Right. That's right. Well. You choose how you want your product to shine and how you want it not to, I guess. Um, the last thing I wanted to get to today is uh, we did not come out of WWDC completely unscathed. We did lose our photo editor. Leanna Lofty, who was our longtime app and photography editor, decided to get a real world job. We are not allowed saying where she is working or for whom, but I do want to thank her for all of her time and effort at iMore. I did the math the other day and I think she'd written something like 800,000 words and over 1,700 articles 
vehicles and who knows how many photos, but all of them were gorgeous. So I wanted to just, on behalf of everybody, wish her well in her new endeavors. And I know that we will all still enjoy her work where, wherever it is. So thank you, Leanna. Thank you, thank you, Leanna. I'm only sorry that I didn't get to work with her longer. Yeah, she was, uh, she was about, I'm not gonna say it, she'll get mad at me for saying it, but she was fantastic in many, many ways. Um, Daniel, I really appreciate you joining us. I've wanted to be on a show with you for a long time, and it's fantastic I had a chance to do that. Yeah, well, it's really great to be here with you guys. It's fun to be able to uh, not only chat with you, but with uh, Peter from my uh, my you know, our home state of <laughs> Massachusetts. So, indeed, if, if people are curious, where can they find out more about you and more about Mars Edit? Well, uh, I'm on Twitter at Neil Punk Ass, uh, just as it sounds, as as crass as it sounds, and I um, I run the Bit Splitting blog and podcast. You can find both of those at bitsplitting.org. And my business, my primary income and passion in this world, as such, is uh, um, is Red Sweater Software, which is at red-sweater.com. And I uh, I make uh, obviously, as we said, Mars Edit, but also some other stuff that's pretty interesting. So. Give it a look, and you can always get in touch with me. Um, so on app.net at Daniel Punk Ass as well. Nice, and we'll put all that in the show notes. And bit splitting is new, but I mean, you came out of the door at a hundred miles an hour. It's sort of the best way I can describe it is you interview really interesting developers and online personalities, but you don't just interview them because of their development work or their online work. You sort of start off at the very beginning and really humanize them, which has always been the most fascinating thing to me about those sorts of shows. Thank you. Yeah, well, I'm really trying hard to meet that standard. Um, the The rough inspiration for the show is basically admiration for interviewers like Terry Gross and my feeling listening to all the great shows um, that interview people I, I am fascinated by, but that focus so narrowly on current achievements, current um, you know, business, current uh, things that are driving people. And when I listen to those shows, I often find myself thinking like, wait a minute, he, he just said he you know, grew up in the Bahamas, Talk, ask more about that, yeah. you know, or, uh, you know, people who we kind of get sometimes the same information again and again from, I just wanted to have an opportunity to, ask, you know, a, a show where it would be obvious to the guest from the get-go that we're going to talk about stuff that doesn't fall into the sort of pseudo PR um, current biographical shot that a lot of podcasts focus on and uh, what so this week's episode was is the new one out or is it still last week's um it's still you know it's a bi-weekly show yeah. so i get a little breather um so we're, we're currently uh still on marco armand's show and you managed to get so marco armand has had three podcasts of his own he has been on every podcast i can think of and you still managed <laughs> to get an, an incredible amount of original material from him Thank you, and I and I was I was confident that I would. Um, I was a little bit annoyed, I have to say, when uh, you know it, it, I actually recorded my show with him a couple weeks ago or a few weeks ago at this point, and I was a little annoyed to get some of the flack on Twitter about people saying, "Well, you know, too late. He's already been on every other podcast," and uh, you know, not everybody, I guess, appreciates or understands yet what you mentioned, Renee, which is yeah. the very format of my show, the nature of the show. And the expectation the guest has when to usually, I think, a very different conversation than you would have um, on most shows. And um, that was true. I think it, it played out, as you, know, as, as you suggested. Yeah, absolutely. A, a lot of stuff that Marco shared with me uh, is a combination of him knowing that the format of the show is different and him, as with all my guests, I hope, trusting that I'm not going to you know, if I if that that if I get them saying something that's you know really deeply personal, but it's their lives, that you know I'll use some good taste in yeah. in, uh, in cutting it out, cutting stuff out if it doesn't seem appropriate. No one will be and, arrested you know, at the end of the show. Exactly. <laughs> and, you know, I have I've, I've very rarely cut anything out, but I I go into every show with that promise, and that's one of the reasons I can't do, for instance, I can't do the show live like we're doing this yeah. here. Um, but the trade-off is I can just say people, look, you know, so far, I'm not, I'm not sure I will always 
limit who I interview to people who I kind of know already, but so far I've been sticking to people I kind of know. And the great advantage there is I can say to people, I'm not going to, I'm not going to mess with you here. You know, this is going to be, this is going to, I'm going to make you look good. I hope, you know, and if I don't, then I think I'm going to have to scrap the episode and find another guest this time, because um, that's the whole point is to make people show people's interesting and good histories. So it's been fun to try to do that. It's been a little nerve wracking, but I'm starting to, uh, starting to relax a little bit. Yeah, no, it's absolutely evident. And uh, congratulations and continued good work with that, sir. Thank you so much. Peter, it's where, really we, nice to hear. Oh, thank you. Peter, where can we find out more about you? On imore.com, of course, and uh, loopinsight.com. And uh, I, I freelance uh, in other places as well. You can also find me on Twitter at Flarg, F-L-A-R-G-H, and on app.net at Flarg as well. Very nice. You know, uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, I, I, I didn't mean to be cutting you off short there at all, Peter. I just wanted to make sure. Be, uh, Manton Reese will be re- really mad at me if I don't include Coreint, of course, coreint.org in um, in my list of major uh, you know projects. Um, it's Core already in the show notes. Is, Okay, great. Um, sorry again, Peter. I, I, I feel I, I just kind of cut you off there, but uh, I thought I thought I um, thought I better get that in. No worries, I'm done. Yeah. All right. There's there's nothing. Manton Reese is from Texas, and there's nothing like having an angry Texas on your tail. So I understand <laughs> <It's so> completely. <true. laughs> However, angry flarg on your tail when he's within <laughs> one hour driving. Uh, That's true. Two hours driving distance. That's true. That's true. Uh, all right, great. Yeah, you can find me at Rene Ritchie. You can find me at imore.com. You can find all of our shows at mobilenations.com. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Peter. That was fantastic, and I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. And thank you, chat Thanks. room. You are a handsome, beautiful, wonderful bunch, and I really appreciate your feedback, too. I like that chat room, people. Yeah, kiss, kiss up to the chat people. I have to. There's, they outnumber me significantly. Yes, that's a nice group you got there. And I think they're armed. 